Let's talk about Plato. Now, Plato is also answering the question, who am I, all right? And for Plato, that question must be answered in terms of the soul, all right? So Plato's going to discuss the soul, what is the soul, as a way of answering the question, who am I, or what is the self, all right? And so in the first text that you have, three parts of the soul, Plato goes about making the argument that there are three parts to the soul. Now, quick aside, Whenever we read Plato, we're also reading Socrates, or at least the early Plato. So Plato was the student of Socrates, and the dialogues that Plato recorded are said to have been the dialogues of Socrates. Socrates was, you know, considered the first philosopher, really the first Greek philosopher, upon which Western philosophy is based. But he was oral. He did not write. He never wrote anything. Um, all of his works have been brought down to us through his student Plato. And so we assume that these are Socrates' arguments. We don't really know how faithful they are to what he said because all of his argumentation was oral. And the oral continues to be a very important part of philosophy. So let's return to the text, three parts of the soul. So what Plato is essentially arguing is that there are three parts to the soul. And he argues this through a series of examples, arguments by example. So if you visit Anthony Weston's book, you'll see the definition for an argument by example. There are several of those in this text. So he starts with this first example, the example of the thirsty man. right? And in fact, the text begins mid-dialogue, in the middle of a dialogue. And you should always read the Platonic text as dialogues. So even though it doesn't say who's speaking to whom, um, you should assume that there's a dialogue going on between two people. Right? And before we go into the text, let's talk a little bit about Plato's rhetorical style. What is Plato's rhetorical style? It's essentially one of um, dialogue, it's a dialogic style, and it's one of questioning. So that the way that Plato makes, Plato and or Socrates make their arguments, is that they ask a series of questions, and when you combine the question with the answer, you get the premise, right? And then there's another question, and another, oops, that should be answer, right? Question one plus answer one is equal to premise one. Question two plus answer two is equal to premise two. And then you get to the conclusion. The conclusion also comes from a, usually a question and answer. So what Socrates does is, is forces his interlocutor, the person he's dialoguing with, to agree with him by asking a series of questions and then leading his interlocutor to the conclusion that he is making, right? So as you read the text, think of it that way. It's a series of questions which combine with the answers, provide the reasons that support the final claim, right? So he starts with this example, the thirsty man, all right? And I read from the text, quote, The soul of a thirsty man, just insofar as he is thirsty, has no other wish than to drink. That is the object of its craving, and towards that it is impelled. Now that's the first person speaking. The second person responds, that is clear. Again, Socrates is speaking. Now it is sometimes true that people are thirsty and yet unwilling to drink. Question. The response, yes, often. Socrates again. What then can one say of them if not that their soul contains something which urges them to drink and something which holds them back? and that this latter is a distinct thing and overpowers the other. To which the person replies, I agree. Okay? So, Socrates proceeds to argue, to demonstrate through this example of the thirsty man, the existence of two distinct principles in the soul. Right? He comes up with these two distinct principles. Make sure you can see it. All right? The first one, which he identifies with the soul and calls rational, is the inhibiting principle, the one that holds the man back. The thirsty man is thirsty, but he does not drink. Why? He is held back by this inhibiting principle, this soul, this rational, this one that, are, or, that has its origin in reflection and that overpowers his desire. Right? So the other principle is this irrational, what what Socrates calls this irrational appetite, right? And it's passionate. Actually, I shouldn't put that there because later he's going to ask whether this is passionate. And we're not to that point yet, right? And these two are in conflict in the case of the thirsty man. So his desire, his irrational appetite tells him to drink, 
But his mind, his reflective, rational soul tells him not to drink. Right? And the soul overpowers, right? The soul always overpowers the irrational appetite. Right? Um, so we associate the irrational appetite with things like hunger and thirst. Socrates also talks about it in terms of sexual impulses and desire. Now all of these words are taken directly from this text. Okay? These are all words taken directly from the text. This is the way in which he identifies these two principles. Right? Now, after this example, he then comes up with another example. Right? And he comes up with this other example because he, ha he asks a question after he finishes distinguishing these two principles. He says, well, we also have these passions like anger and, and the feeling of being indignant. And so he asks the question whether or not that is also something that could be classified as either rational or irrational appetite. Right? Is it one of these two principles? So he asks, um, he concludes, you know, partway through this, this, this first page, quote, let us take it then that we have now distinguished two elements in the soul, right, through this example of the thirsty man. What of that passionate element which makes us feel anger and indignant? Right? So we have this question about passion, right? Something like anger and indignancy, right? Is that a third or identical in nature with one of these two? So is this a third principle, or could we say that this is an example of the irrational or the rational? Right? So this is the question that Socrates asks. And his interlocutor responds, well, I think that's just another form of, of the appetitive, right? We could just kind of lump that under here, right? That anger and being indignant probably is a, it's just a form of irrational appetite. But Socrates does not agree. And so Socrates responds, I am more inclined to put my faith in a story I once heard about Leonidas, right? And then he tells this story, right? So this is a second argument by analogy. Sorry, argument by example, right? And so this story and sometimes you can use stories this way, and Socrates says, you use a story to provide a, some, a reasoning to support your claim. It's like a, a premise. So, you know, the story, in this case, serves as an argument by example, which supports his claim, right? So what does the story tell us? Um, Plato's using this story to demonstrate the existence of a third element, right? He wants to show that there are actually not just two but that there are three elements. And so in this story, we have this, this man who sees this dead body and, you know, does not want to look at the dead body. He's, you know, reviled by it, disgusted by it, and yet he, he can't help but to go and look at it, right? And so in this case, Socrates says that anger is sometimes in conflict with appetite because for Leonidas, what happens is he has, he has three different impulses. He has a desire not to see it, right, because it disgusts him, but then something compels him to go look at it, right, but then he becomes angry with himself, right, he becomes angry with himself when he does look at it, right, and so this is an example for Socrates in which there are at least three different principles at play here, there are not just two, there are three, right, Because anger, Socrates explains, is in conflict with appetite in this example. So in Leonidas's case, it is not the case that his anger is lined up nicely with his impulse or his desire. They're actually in conflict. And so if they're co in conflict, they must be two distinct things. So that, that gives us three distinct things. Okay. And so, but then, you know, we... Maybe we're not convinced that there are three distinct things. And so we are given two more examples. We're given the example of the man who is wrong, right? The wrongdoer. And also the man who has been wronged, right? Or the person who has been wronged or the person who is a wrongdoer, right? And what, what, what Socrates argues that is in both these cases, let's move this down, right? We have indignity in conflict with appetite, right? And aligned with reason, right? So if we look at the first example, 
This is on page 7. Quote, take a man who feels he is in the wrong. The more generous his nature, the less he can be indignant at any suffering, such as hunger and cold, inflicted by the man he has injured. He recognizes such treatment as just, and as I say, his spirit refuses to be roused against it. Right? So you've committed a crime, you are truly remorseful, and you're forced to be deprived of your freedom, right? To be put into jail and to be fed bread and water. Um, you don't want to be fed bread and water. You don't have a desire to be confined or to co be cold or to wear a prison uniform. But because your sense of righteousness, you know, recognizes that you are wrong, it's compatible with your being hungry and cold and, and confined because you know it's the right thing to do. So in this case, the, the person who is wrong, you know, their indignity or their sense of, of, of anger or dignity is lined up with reason and it's compatible with hunger and cold, right? It's, it's sorry, not compatible. It's, it's an opposition to hunger and cold. So the desire is for, you know, being warm and, and, and well-fed, but in this, in this case, one's sense of passion, right, actually is able to override the appetite. One is able to suffer gladly, because one's sense of passion knows it's the right thing to do, right? In the case of the wrong person, right, this is someone who is the victim of a wrong, this person's sense of passion or indignity, right? Um, where's our example here? Let's just read it aloud. Contrast one who thinks it is he that is being wronged. His spirit boils with resentment and sides with the right as he conceives it, Persevering all the more for the hunger and cold and other pains he suffers, it triumphs and will not give in until its gallant struggle has ended in success or death. Right? So that if you feel that you have been wrong, think about revolutionaries, right? People who are willing to go on hunger strikes, who are willing to, you know, sacrifice everything and to, and to risk their life for what they believe is, wrong, is right, right? So their sense of passion at being, say, a victim of injustice will force them to sacrifice their desires, right, on the side of reason. So he has these two examples, and then he asks the question, well, um, you know, is, you know, he had asked, is, is anger or passion always in conflict with appetite, right, as it is in, in these two examples, and is it always in league with reason, as it is in these examples, and if so, how do we know that it's not just a form of reason? Perhaps passion is just a part of number one, right, the soul, the rational, maybe it's just a, an aspect of it. And so in the final part of the argument, Socrates has to convince us that this passionate element is separate from the rational soul, because if it's not, it's not a distinct principle, right? So how does he do that? On page 7, right, he says, is it then distinct from the rational element or only a particular form of it, so that the soul will contain no more than two elements, reason and appetite, right? How do we know it's just not a part of reason? Does the spirited element, right, passion, make a third that's a natural auxiliary to reason, or is it just a part of reason, right? And so he, he has to say, we have to show that it's distinct. How does he show that it's distinct? He says, that is easily proved, Socrates says. Quote, you can see that much in children. He gives two examples. Children and, is it an, is another animal? And animals. There are two examples that prove his point. Children, they are full of passionate feelings from their very birth, but some, I should say, never become rational, and most of them only late in life. So here we have an example that shows that it's possible to be passionate without being rational. And then a second example is that seen in, in animals. Animals can also be passionate and yet lack the element of rationality. Mm -hmm. And that is how he, con he concludes that there are three principles to the soul.